Aladino Cabrera, one of millions of farmers around the world who are forced to destroy their environment just to feed their families. Forests are cut down, left to dry and burnt. It's a temporary solution of which farmers are all too aware. This destroys the soil fertility, I know this. But we have no choice to grow our food, do you understand? The crops are sown straight into the nutrient-rich ash. Yet even as they're being planted, fertility is already waning in the soils. What firewood is left will be taken for the kitchen. But as the forests disappear, this too becomes harder to find. To supplement fertility, farmers will often turn to chemical fertilizers, an expense that few can afford. Weeds are a constant problem. They grow this tall eight times a year. So this is only around a month and a half old. So farmers will turn to chemicals to clear the weeds, yet more expense and a health risk. But regardless of the pesticides and the fertilizers, soils will often fail, which can mean disaster for the family. We might get three sacks from this. Perhaps not even that. They're completely ruined. This shifting imperative will drive farmers to clear yet more forest, and so the cycle continues. But there is a little known alternative to this. For over 25 years, British scientist Mike Hans has been perfecting an alternative to slash and burn farming. Following successful trials in Central America, farmers are now working with it. It's transforming agriculture as we know it. You've got to learn from what the forest is doing. It's the most sustainable, most productive ecosystem on the planet. You have got to listen to it. You're seeing a cropping system which takes place between rows of trees the system is called alley cropping because the rows resemble alleyways. Rows of trees are planted close together uh, in what was a grass dominated site. And the trees have grown and have now completely shaded out all of the grass. It's dark and for that reason you hardly see any weed growth. At the appropriate time, they will be pruned down to about the height of one's chest. And the mulch, the green material from the leaves will be placed on the, on the ground as a physical protection and as slowly decomposing green manure. A lot of the big stems, big branches will be removed for firewood for the kitchen. It's a very big factor in Honduras, much more important than I imagined when we started this. Once the light has been let in and the ground is covered with mulch, the crop uh, can be sown. 
It's got enough strength to come up through the, the cover of mulch, which will largely be suppressing all the regrowth of weeds. During the course of the growth of the crop, the trees will regrow. There'll be a little bit of light pruning of the regrowth to control the shade. At the point of cropping, the trees are regenerating. They'll recover the canopy and they'll be available for pruning and cropping the following year. What Inga particularly appears capable of doing is to at least retrieve, retain, and recycle the key nutrients. You're simulating what's going on in the forest. You're not trying to fight it. Welcome to the Inga Foundation's educational DVD. This film will take you through the benefits of the system and show you how to do it yourselves. At the end, you'll get a booklet which shows the technical details and will serve as a reference guide. The first step is seed collection. Most Inga species seeds come in long pods, which need to be removed from the branches. The seeds are surrounded by a sweet pulp. The reason they're sometimes called ice cream beans. You can see by the size and shape that these are healthy seeds and the vines are perfectly mature. This is important. You should not pick the vine too young. You can see all the different colors here. These are greeny yellow, and these are completely purple. And these ones here are orange. So you can see the color and the shape can vary greatly, and they're ready to be germinated. These seeds here have been recently harvested. At this point, it's best to plant them in bags immediately because when they're fresh, they germinate much better. <laughs> You'll sometimes see that the seeds might have some superficial damage. Nonetheless, we should always use these because as you can see here, the embryo is in perfect condition and this should germinate perfectly well. So it's only when it's very badly damaged that you should throw it away. The bags are firmly filled with fertile soil into which the seeds will be planted. Each of the seeds has a small cross at one end, which should be planted downwards. The next stage is to create nurseries in which the saplings will be grown. Inga seeds are quick to germinate, but they need to be cared for to grow into healthy saplings. When establishing a nursery, it's important to keep the growing plants well watered. The ideal location is a spot with some light shade to protect the little trees from the full sunlight. Instead of seed bags, the seeds can also be planted into seed beds and transplanted bare root. If growing on open ground, we recommend using a simple awning of palm leaves to break the sunlight. After around three months, the trees will be sufficiently strong and ready to be taken to their final home. 
Typically in slash and burn farming, soils are swept down hillsides and eroded. But with Inga alley cropping, the trees are planted along the contours of the hillsides. In doing this, the tree roots secure the soil and the erosion is stopped in its tracks. To find these contour lines, we're going to build a simple tool known as an A-frame. In this section, we'll go through the steps to make and use it. The first step is to build it. Regresamos. So the main struts are two meters and 10 centimeters long. So why are they two meters, Alejandro? Because it allows us to accurately measure. And if we need to count, you can easily say you've gone that many meters across and in each meter you've planted this many trees. So the crossbar is 110 centimeters long. It cuts across the A. This is important to know. So make this a, a good and straight cut. These are for a flat surface to measure the A-frame. Now we move to nailing it together. We need to make sure they're equal lengths. And now we open it. So we make sure that each leg is on the two meter lines that we scored into these. So let's just measure it again. And now we lie it down. And now we have to measure halfway from end to end and make sure it's two meters. And then we mark a hundred centimeters here, halfway along. Mark between the two of them to show where the nail goes. And now it's important to measure it again and make sure it's still two meters. When you nail the other side, you have to hold it to make sure it doesn't move. Now, the next step is to calibrate the A-frame, and we use a hanging bob from up here to down there. And it's hard to find stones here, so we can use the measure, or better still, this hammer. Now wait for a while and let it hit three or four times in the same spot. Now, one end might be higher than the other, so we need to do the other side and check. So this time you find the middle and I'll hold the frame. So where would you say the level goes? In the middle of the two? Yeah, exactly. So if we don't want to use a line, we can use this and we fix it where it's level. Just cut a little mark here. And you can also use a vine for this. But now the A-frame is ready, but we always need to find the center with the hanging bob. So now is the next step, which is plotting the mother line. The mother line is the line running down the slope from top to bottom of the plot. The contour lines run off this line. The A-frame can be used to measure 4 meter gaps in the spaces 
and ensure consistent width between the rows. OK, Alejandro, we're at the highest point of the plot where we begin the mother line, from which we're going to take the contour lines. So we'll put the first stick here. The A-frame is simply walk down the hillside from the first stick. Each second foot will mark four meters between each new contour line. So, here's our mother line finished. We can do it with the A-frame or with a long line from top to bottom. But either method is fine. The A-frame is then used to mark two meter spacings. Using the spirit level will ensure that the trees follow the contour of the terrain. So which ones would you move to make the line a bit smoother? The fourth one? And that one a bit too? Maybe the fourth one and that one. Exactly, that's it. Move that one down a bit as well. Now you see the line's a bit smoother and has less of this zigzag motion. Perfecto. Muy bien. Excelente. We're now locating the planting holes between the contour sticks already in place. You can use a one meter stick to measure halfway and then estimate the 50 centimeters planting holes between. So, Alejandro, to plant the trees, the hole doesn't need to be very big. And just crumble the soil a bit so the vertical root doesn't suffer. So now, in these nodules, bacteria exists. And this bacteria is what makes it possible for nitrogen to be absorbed from the air and used by the tree. So they're working day and night. They're a kind of factory that produces urea or nitrogen in the plant. Depending on how degraded a plot is, it can take two to three years before the trees can recapture the site from the weeds and restore soil fertility to the point at which crops can be planted. When the tree canopy has closed and the weeds have been suppressed, you can choose when to prune the trees and plant the crop. We recommend to cut the tree at a 45 degree angle because if we cut it flat, the water gathers and begins rotting the trunk. You can see here that I've left the branches in the plot. I've left them all here because until I harvest the tomatoes, it supports them. The second step is to strip the leaves and create the carpet of green manure, the mulch. The leaves will release the nutrients to the crops as they grow, but also help smother the weeds and shield the soils from the heat of the sun. The leaves are lightly slashed to help the decomposition. All of this material from his last pruning. Just look how much there is. Next year, all of this is going to be decomposed organic matter. So this is the life of the soil. This is my life, the life of our children and of their children. 
But look at it, this is amazing. Look how the fungus is breaking down the leaves. The trees are also surprisingly quick at recovering from the pruning. The date we pruned a few trees as a test was on the 2nd of August. Can you pass me the bag, please? Look, this has grown 20 centimeters already. And this one as well, 20 centimeters. Some of these have grown already 20 centimeters just in a month. It's sometimes just simple comparisons that show the best results of alley cropping with Inga. My friends, this is traditional agriculture. This cob here is miserable. So let's make a comparison in Lorenzo's plot and see the difference. Poor, poor maize. No, there's no hope for life here. Well, we can see here how Lorenzo's maize is superb. We just came from a traditional farming plot. That farmer burnt his forest and then he planted beans and then maize. Now see this cob? This is grown with Inga. And this one, the traditional slash and burn. A huge difference. I don't really think we need glasses to see the reality here. It's past the test. So this is traditionally grown, and this is grown with Inga. See, now doing this, we can talk about food security. If we have one or maybe two well-managed plots like this, it means the entire family can come here and feed themselves. Many people talk about food sovereignty, but we can't if we don't grow our own food. This cob is going to be wonderful. Mm, so sweet. Another huge advantage of alley cropping with Inga is the production of firewood for use in the kitchen or for sale. Because the plots can be closer to the home, the younger members of the family can also get involved. Well, in, in this plot, we haven't even taken out half of the wood yet. We got a huge amount, around 400 bundles of wood from just half a hectare. And it's not only the younger members of the family who benefit from the proximity of the alley plots, the ladies of the household can also be involved. Before, we used to go to the forest. We'd cut the trees down, we'd let them dry, and we'd bring the wood to the kitchen. The Inga system didn't exist then. We didn't even know. So we don't need to work as hard as before. Nothing like before. The wood dries fast, and what it does, it's light to carry. Look, it was worth it growing the Inga. Now I've got wood near the house. I've got this organic fertilizer. I need this for my tortillas. Okay. Yet all this wood can also be transformed. My charcoal keeps perfectly, it doesn't spoil. This is all from Inga. The sacks of charcoal a year old in there, a whole year old. And it's as good as when we made it. Invasive weeds are also dealt with by alley cropping. You remember that field there? This was like that, covered in weeds. And now look at it, it's all gone. Well, there's some, but they're more dead than alive. 
When I prune again, they'll be gone too. Weeds are killed off by the shade, but also because of the leaf fall from under the growing trees. And they stay smothered under the thick mulch when the trees are pruned. But even where weeds do make it through, the system also has an answer. If the soil is exposed directly to the sun, the weed roots go deep and it's really difficult to get them out. But when they just go into the Inga mulch, the roots are shallow and they're weak. And the alley plots even encourage some weeds which are helpful. When alley plots get established, this starts appearing. We call it yerba mora. The white fly is becoming like a plague in some areas because we burn all its food. But when we have this in the plots, it simply eats this and not the crops. The Inga tree also has nectary glands. These attract predatory insects which help protect the crops. One day, in the original Costa Rica project, I saw large wasps in the plots, looking around in the bean crops. I saw one land on a bean vine and pull out a larva this big. What they do is leave the nest and go looking for the larvae that they need to survive. So these wasps are my biological control. Many people think ants are bad. They lay poison and try to kill them. But these ants are actually very important. You see, what they're doing here is looking for the larvae as well. So if there's a larva that enters the maize stem here, the ants go in and they eat them. Look, here's one looking now. And the benefits of alley cropping go far beyond subsistence crops. Alley cropping is also perfect for cash crops. All of the produce is naturally organic. And tomatoes are just one of the examples. Faustino Reyes has proved that these grow beautifully in the plots. But they're far from the only cash crop that the system works with. Pedro has had great success with black pepper. When it's ready to harvest, it goes yellow and red as well. Just one well-managed plant can produce eight pounds of dry pepper, maybe more. In raw weight, perhaps 15 pounds. Doña Valentina has also had great success with pepper. Her husband grows it, and with her son, she harvests and sells it, whole and ground. Well, the other day I sold just a few pounds of pepper, and from just that, I got 900 lempiras. And you sold them whole? Yes. And you used no chemicals here? No, just the inga and some other leaves. So when it's ready, I put it in bags and off I go and I sell it. And they ask for more? Oh, of course. I only went last week and they told me to come back this week with more. I can't lie, I got five pounds of pepper from one plant, dry pepper. All of that just from one plant. And pepper is joined by other cash crops that grow well in the alleys. Vanilla has also been proven to thrive. Pineapple has also proved itself to grow extremely well in the alleyways.
The original idea wasn't to plant pineapples here just yet, because these plots are still recuperating. Nevertheless, look, these pineapples are totally organic. You can eat these with total confidence. So here's the great advantage to cultivating with Inga. We can grow in harmony with nature. This is the third and final component using Inga alley cropping, the restoration of the landscape itself. The model that the foundation wants to put into action with each family is based on one hectare for subsistence crops, and another hectare for cash crops, but also an area for reforestation. The whole strategy is that once food security can be achieved, a hectare of alley cropping should give that family food security. Plus, perhaps another hectare of cash crops. That will liberate land for trees. Well, I was thinking that that area there would be perfect. I'd like to really reforest the whole thing and amongst the trees put some fruit trees, some timber trees, some cacao. This is how we're saying they can reforest. Plant Inga at four meter intervals. Leave gaps. When the Inga has begun to recapture the site from the grass, interplant it with the rainforest trees, the mahoganies, the rosewoods, the valuable fine hardwoods. And we think in about 20 years that family could be harvesting timber, its own timber. Well, these seeds came from a teacher from Las Mangas, and when he brought them to me, he also brought five for my friend. And my friend says, what are these? And I said, mahogany. And he said, why do I want these? And I said, grow them for your kids. And he said, my kids eat food, they don't eat wood. We're talking about many, many millions of hectares of forest that have been lost and which could be restored.